Welcome to the Susan Sly Project, where entrepreneurs rule, startups launch, and the side hustle becomes the main hustle. Ladies and gentlemen, your host, Susan Sly. Well, wherever you are in the world, I want to welcome you. I want to acknowledge you for listening to the show. And here's what I know about you. You are looking for more in your life. You are contemplating starting a side hustle. Maybe you've got one. Maybe you're somewhere in the world thinking about starting a business and envisioning that it could be full time. And my guest today is a renowned speaker, author, coach, transformational leader. This woman has worked in the corporate sector. She has mentored incredible CEOs and high achieving individuals. And before I bring her out, just a quick announcement. If you would like me to coach you for free, head over to susansly.com, susansly.com and get on the list. I do free coaching for people on the list. And we've had people grow and scale businesses. In fact, one of the people who came to free coaching, Amber Johnson, she started a company called Jam. She now has meetings with O Magazine. She has been on TV. All of the coaching was done for free. I mean, it's incredible. And so go to SusanSly.com, get on the list. I would love to see you there. So I, my amazing guest is currently residing in the UK. She has a tremendous following. She has a passion for service. She's the CEO and founder of two separate companies, Inspiring Hope Limited and JacinthIvy.com. She has won multiple awards for her transformational leadership. And this woman, I have to tell you, in our pre-interview, I, I haven't been, I'm, I'm always excited about doing a show, but you know, I've been counting down the days until we did our show because yeah. I know that thousands of you around the world are going to be blessed by her message. So Jacinth, welcome to the show. Susan, it is wonderful to be here and thank you for such a, an amazing welcome. Well, I want to dive right in. You know, I what do you want to say to the person who's sitting there right now? They're maybe a little paralyzed. Prior to COVID, they were thinking of starting a business, pivoting their career, maybe even going full time into a business they had started, but they're paralyzed. What do you want to say to them? Fear is uh, it absolutely does paralyze. But the thing that I really want to say from the outset is that there is brilliance in every single one of us. No matter what we think, no matter how we feel, there is brilliance within. And it's so important to acknowledge your brilliance. And one of the things I say very clearly is your brilliance isn't measured against anybody else's brilliance. It is unique to you. It is unique to me. And so what I am brilliant at may not be what you're brilliant at and may not measure up to your brilliance, but it is within every single one of us. That's so beautiful. And, and I know you and I have done, you know, so many, um, so many years and years of philanthropy yeah. and charity work. And we've worked with a lot of women who perhaps have been through some atrocious things, whether it's um, sexual abuse, uh, whether it's um, infidelity, whether it's homelessness. And I know you and I have walked very similar paths and, and, and how can one coach unless they've transcended? Mm-hmm. And that's why I have so much respect for you. What about a woman who's listening now and saying, Jacinth, I don't know if there's brilliance inside me because I've spent my life being told I can't do something or I'm not smart enough or I'm not capable enough. How does someone begin to discover their brilliance? Yeah, I mean, the the words that people say to us can be absolutely crushing. And we know the saying that says there is life and death in the power of the tongue. And so it's really important to go back to acknowledge who you are, who you were before all of this trauma happened in our lives. Yes, all of this trauma, all of the disappointment. Who are you when when you are most happy and at one with you, with yourself? And just try and capture those moments. And when you're at one with yourself, how do you choose to show up? How are you? What do you do? What makes you happy? Because the trauma puts up these barriers, puts up these fences, and we can no longer see ourselves as we used to be. So we have become the person that the abuser has turned us into. 
And so it's really important to, to go back and to think about who is it, you know, when I was born, when I was created, who was I created to be? What am I most happiest at and my most happiest time? And it's to go back to that time when you can smile about you. Because during trauma, we can't smile about us because there is so much pain wrapped up in it. And so it's really important to go back to that place. Now, that can take some time for some women because, as we know, trauma is layered upon layered upon layer. Some of it is, as we know, over an extended period of time. But I always say that there is brilliance within you. And if we work together, I work with my clients at really trying to identify what that is, where that is, and when that happened, and go back to that place. That's, that's beautiful, Jacintha. I mean, just as you were sharing that, I started to smile. And, and as I mentioned, you and I have both endured a lot of trauma. And um, a friend of mine said the other day, Susan, I can't stop thinking about what you said. I was coaching a group of entrepreneurs. And I said, when is now the time to stop giving purpose to your pain? And perhaps you could share with everyone, our viewers, our listeners, your journey, because you're speaking from a place of experience. You transcended trauma and have decided to spend your career helping and serving others do the same and discovering their brilliance so they can be more powerful. So could you share a little bit about your journey? Yeah, I can. And trauma takes on many facets. So I'm the youngest of five children. My parents came to UK from the West Indies. So they were part of the Windrush era. And we grew up in an area, so I'm African Caribbean heritage. And we grew up in an area that was predominantly white. Um, and so we were faced with a lot of uh, racial abuse um, to signs that said no blacks, no Irish, no dogs, um, not wanting to provide us with housing. My parents would book a holiday, we'd turn up and they'd say, sorry, no blacks, or it was full. And so we had a lot of that kind of racial, racial abuse. And that transcended to my schooling with my teachers telling me I would never be any good that I was wild and woolly, that the most I could ever hope to do was to work in a factory or to work in a shop. That was my career's advice. In secondary school, I was brilliant at athletics. So it was a case of, well, forget your academic education and do athletics. Um, I transcended throughout my life. I became a nurse. So I trained as a nurse very early on. But again, I was told, um, perhaps you should just do basic nursing and that girls like you are best to work in psychiatry or with older people, girls like you. Um, and you're good at basic nursing. So there was a lot of kind of that racial abuse in terms of that in terms of that trauma. There were lots of what we call microaggressions in the workforce. Um, being left off emails, being left out of conversations, um, people asking if they could call me by a different name because they felt my name was too difficult to pronounce. So lots of these kind of microaggressions that actually have a macro impact on individuals can really impact on their psychological well-being, on their sense of who they are. So lots of kind of, I was bullied, in the workforce, and I was an executive director at the time. So I, you know, managed to break through that, not only the glass ceiling for women, but also this um, into the boardroom where it was predominantly white. And so I was the only person of color in that boardroom. And I was bullied, bullied very badly to the point that I had high levels of anxiety. I had to leave work. I needed psychological help and support. So that was a, another trauma that at away at my self-esteem. And then in relationships, like many women who get married at a young age, have children and end up divorced. That's another trauma. Prior, previous to that, I wasn't able to have children. So there's the trauma of infertility. There's a trauma that was related to um, getting to a place of unemployment 
So when I left, when I was bullied and left, I set up my own business and was doing really well, Susan. I was working with large corporates, delivering training and providing consultancy, was doing really, really well, was earning lots and lots of money. And then we had the recession of 2008 and my world collapsed. All of those contracts went I ended up nearly losing my house. I ended up on government financial support. Um, I ended up with so-called friends disappearing or my work associates disappearing and managed to work my way back up. The trauma is upon the trauma, having a hysterectomy at age 40, um, which went horribly wrong um, and ended up in a very life-threatening situation. And 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 there it's it's just so multi-layered, Susan. It's so multi-layered in lots of different lots of different ways in abusive relationships, not physically abusive, but verbally abusive relationships. Um even, even within the church environment where one would think that there would be safety in a in a place of, you know, in a religious place, place of faith, but actually not quite fitting in to um, the culture of that environment and being told that you're different. And so throughout my life, when I really looked back at my life, there were always the place, I was always at a place where I was different. Didn't quite fit in, I was different. But one of the things that I learned through my own, through working with myself, through a coach, through the psychological support was, it's okay to be different. And that's the title of my book is It's Okay to Be Different. Acknowledge Your Brilliance. Just then, thank you for your your transparency. There there are so many people listening right now or watching right now who get it. And there are many who, who don't because they haven't had that experience. I, I, I have a similar background in that I grew up in a very small, predominantly white town, and there were only five families who weren't white, mine being one. So I was bullied. I was beaten. On top of it, I was very overweight. I was being raised by a single father. So in the 70s, you know, it's like, how different can you be, right? And I had all of those strikes against me, so to speak. And, and, the pain. And I used to go home and look in the mirror and just punch myself over and over and over again. And just always thinking, why can't I fit in? And it was this, this whole existence of, you know, almost like Ken and Barbie, right? Where Ken and Barbie and they have the kids and, and, and setting that as a standard. And it took a very long time for me to celebrate my differences and brilliance, but it's interesting what you mentioned about these microaggressions. So these still happen to me today, working in um, one of my companies that I run is technology. So it's often me and all men. And um, interestingly enough, what I did a presentation to a group of men. And then this man said to me, oh, I find that women CEOs have to compensate And I went, for what? Would that be like you having to compensate if you had small feet? I don't understand. (laughs) You know, and and sorry, gentlemen who are listening, I I just, you know, it it, it doesn't matter if you're a man or you're a woman or, or however you align, if you've ever experienced this, and it still happens today where I've been shut out of emails or I've been treated a certain way. And so I... I was having a discussion with a, a friend um, and, and he said, well, you, you've become very wealthy. So you obviously had the same opportunities as everyone else. And I went, what? And what I likened it to was this, women like you and I are going to achieve no matter what, because we're survivors. However, it's like this, we're all start, we're going to run a marathon and if there are perceptions about color, culture, gender, it's like everyone's on the start line, but you're starting several miles yeah. back. 
Absolutely. <laughs> and, but you're expected to still, you know, win the race. So yeah. it's, it's, you would think that at the ages you and I are, that we wouldn't still be having these discussions about this. And so what, you know, what, what kind of advice do you give to someone listening who is in that situation? They're having these microaggressions. How should they show up and handle this? You've, firstly, you've got to show up as yourself. For me, when I when I re- I remember when these microaggressions first started, I was a little bit unsure about how should I respond. I would sometimes pretend I didn't hear, but felt really, really offended. And then as I got to be more confident in myself, in terms of who I am, and actually, you know, that greater sense, we know what's right and wrong. Um, and then I found ways to answer back. So... I remember a couple of years ago at a board meeting, it was very hot and I went to the meeting and one of my colleagues looked at me and said, is it hot enough for you? Oh and my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so is it hot enough for you? And um, so I said, so I thought, okay, I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. And I said, it is, it's a beautiful day. I'm sure we're all really warm. He then said, and when last did you go home? And so I said, I go home every night, thank you. (laughs) And so, and so, it gets to a point where actually I'm sure a lot of us, we get to a point where we've heard so many of these microaggressions. And what we have to do is to not let it penetrate and find a response, but choose the moment. Sometimes we choose to say nothing, but that's the choice that we've made. Mm -hmm. And other times we choose to say nothing for that moment because it's not appropriate at that moment to respond. And another time you might have a response that that you can fire back. And I would always say, fire back with a response that you can actually smile through. Mm. Yeah, that actually says, even if you're hurt to the core, that actually says, you haven't hurt me, but you need to understand that this is not acceptable. Um, And sometimes the the calling, we have to call it out. Recently, one of the chief executives in one of the organisations I'm working with, um, as a response to Black Lives Matter and as a response to COVID and the disproportionate impact on on, um, people of colour, was saying, what what do I do as an organisation? What do we do? We don't know what to do. And I always said to him, one of the first things you have got to do is you've got to be outraged at what's happening. You've got to be outraged. You've got to be willing to call it out. And you've got to be willing to be uncomfortable. You've got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's the same with microaggressions. We have that outrage. We have to be willing to call it out. That may be uncomfortable, but unless we get to that place of being uncomfortable, we won't be able to push through. We won't make that difference. I I love that. I wrote these steps down. So being yourself first and foremost, and that self identity can be multifaceted. So I'm I did my twenty three and me just because I was like you know I've I've always felt that I didn't when when one is mixed too. It's like where do I fit in in all these different places? And I found out thanks to twenty three and me, like there's not one sort of area particularly. So myself is who I am, and and it's when I wrote the book Have It All Woman, I talked about the Scarlet Letter, and so when when um, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote the book, The Scarlet Letter, Hester Prim had to wear the big A for adulterer. And so often we, as women, as men, we wear all of these scarlet letters that that we have determined are perhaps a negative and they're not, right? So it's, and, and I think we reach an age and stage. And the thing that excites me about Generation Z or Generation Z, depending where you live, is so many of these kids are much more grounded in who they are 
more so than we ever were at that generation. I mean, I had a beautiful chat with my daughter's boyfriend about Black Lives Matter and about racial inequality. And he's 20 years old and he's white, but he gets it. And he said the same thing. We have to be able to call it out because this thinking about very deeply the world that we're handing off to the next generations and we're still having the same conversations, even though we've got so we've, we're dealing right now with COVID record unemployment rates. <laughs> we're dealing with business closures and yeah. we can't even get it together in terms of respecting one another. Good yeah. Lord. <laughs> yeah. They, they, that, that generation have so much to teach us and they have the innate values around fairness, justice, equity. It just is for them. It just is. And so to, to be amongst people or in societies where that is not so is, is alien to them is alien to them. And I thought one of the most beautiful things in watching the Black Lives Matter was the whole mix, the whole rainbow of colours in relation to the people that were there. You know, young people, old people of different races, different nations, different backgrounds. And I I thought that was incredibly, incredibly um, beautiful. But I think you know, you talked earlier, one of the things that we have to do, you talked about the letter A, and we have, you know, we have life experiences. Some of them we're proud of, some of them we're not so proud of. But, you know, we have to learn to forgive ourselves. Mm. We have to learn to forgive ourselves. We have to ask for forgiveness. So as a Christian, when I pray, I ask for forgiveness, knowing that God is, a, is faithful to forgive me. But unless I forgive myself, that request is just completely null and void. And so that takes time because often we're left with some negative emotions around shame, around guilt. What did other people feel? What did other people think? And we do have to get to a place. And one of the things you said earlier, we have to choose. When is now the right time to choose to forgive, to forgive yourself and to forgive others? And it's easier, I have to say, Susan, it's easier said than done. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I'm a constant work. I constantly have to review myself. I constantly have to check almost as if to say, have I forgiven? Have I really forgiven? And the way my sense check is, what are the emotions that are around? When I remember or when I think about the incident, what are the emotions that that carries? If there is, if the emotions are less than three, if I was to number them, 10 being really high, zero being naught, then I think, okay, I'm really working on that forgiveness. I'm beginning to forgive, forgive myself and forgive others. And it's a really hard thing to do. So it's easy for me to say, but some people say, but yes, Justin, but that's really hard because of X, Y, and Z. They did this, they did that. This is what happened to me. But all it exceeds, all it succeeds in doing is eating away at us. It causes high levels of anxiety. It causes dis-ease in our bodies. So we get a chemical reaction. It causes high blood pressure. It interferes with our relationship with self, with significant others. And so it's let it go. It's yes, I love what you said. It's it's easier said than done. And when we're in that victim energy, it's like a magnet for negativity. And so there's a there's such a difference between being a victim and being a victor. The the town I grew up in where I was very badly bullied and beaten is a 20,000 person town in Canada. And recently they erected this sign that says, we will not tolerate racism. So I'm not perfect. I did have to ask God for forgiveness just because initially I was in my mind, I was like, where was that sign in 1978? (laughs) And I'm going, Susan, you know, there it's there now. And that's the, the, the message I want to convey is you cannot drive forward in an automobile, if I'm on an, I've driven in the UK and I think I deserve a star for it because it is quite some crazy driving that some, in some of the villages, the roads are very narrow and you're passing another car and you're like, yeah, and suck it in. Like I'm driving past another car and I'm like, 
get skinny, right? Anyway. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, that's right. So I, you know, it's the, it's, we can't drive forward if we're driving on a, an M road or in the autostrada or any of the, you know, places around the world with these fast highways, looking in our rear view mirror. And at mm-hmm. some point we all have to make the decision we're moving forward and look for ways to connect, not ways to disconnect. I was in a, a village just in the, uh, in Malawi, um, outside of the long way several years ago. And, um, so we walk into this village and the little children are like, as Zungu, as Zungu, as Zungu, it just means white person. And, um, and I was like, wow, I'm not white, but I guess I am you compare like, you know, in this village and, and I didn't speak Chichewa and the women just come and they grab me and everyone started singing and dancing. And so then I started dancing and then we were all dancing together. We're laughing together. And this little boy comes in, he's dancing in the center. And, and the reason I share this story is there's always a way to connect. If we set the intention, if we're seeking our similarities and not our differences, right? I want to ask you, You've had several career fr- pivots, my love, and uh, there are listeners right now who are just so ex- excited and inspired by your message. And one of the questions I get asked a lot on LinkedIn is, "How do I pivot my career?" And there are a lot. There are many people who've been furloughed. There are many people who've been laid off, and they're thinking, "Should I start a business? Should I go back to school? Should I pivot?" Because you've done this so successfully, more than once. What advice, what steps would you give to that person yeah. who wants to pivot? So one of the first things that I did was to recognize I needed to pivot, I, to recognize I needed to do something and something differently. And so what I did was I reviewed myself. So I reviewed what do I know? Um, either what have I gained through experience or what have I gained through formal education? Um, so what am I, what's my knowledge? What, what are my skills? What are I good at? And, and when I did this review, it was about whole life, not just related to my professional life. So what do I know? What experience have I had? Who do I know? What skills have I got? And I really started to do this inventory of all of these skills. And I challenged myself to write for... Um, in bullet points for 10 minutes without taking my pen off the paper. And so that might not sound a long time, but you have got to keep writing. What are you good at? Who do you know? What are your skills? What are your knowledge? What's your knowledge base? I mean, I put things down like um, I can bake a cake. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. What kind of so cake? when 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 I got when I got stuck, I thought oh, I can make a cake. <laughs> I can make I love quite to, nice. I love to cake. bake too. We'll have to have a, a whole separate discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but the the point about it is just to keep writing because that way actually you start to get this download. So the first minute is quite difficult. Then after a while you start to get a download, and then that for the start when you start to look at that paper and you think, wow. I've got all this knowledge, skills, confidence, all of these things. And then you start to think, okay, so, and my second point of thinking is, so what do people want? What do people want? What do people need? Yeah. And I, and, and I had that conversation with myself whilst I was looking at this list in front of me. Um, and I started also to think about, well, what am I passionate about? Because I actually want to do something that, that fuels my passion, my desire, my purpose. What am I really passionate about? And one of the things I recognize is I am really passionate about developing people, developing organizations to be the best that they can be. So, right, so how do I do that? How can I do that based on all all of this knowledge and skills? Um, And so that's why I thought actually moving from my corporate life, there were two areas that I want to really help. One of the things I absolutely adored was working with women. Um, And I did a lot of work with women in my corporate life to support them from moving um, up through the career ladder up into senior positions. And one of the things that I recognized earlier on was going back to our first conversation was that a lot of the women did not have a really good and true sense of self. 
And that actually, that was the real foundation for them is when they started to understand themselves and their self-worth and their self-value, they then were saying, well, I can go for that position. I can go for that position. And so within all of this, so there's work on self, reviewing your skills, really starting to think about um, people's pain points, have discussions with a whole, when you have discussions with whoever you have discussions with, really start to listen to some of the things that they say um, and to see how you could provide a solution to that. So that's how I trans, how, how I moved into coaching. That's how I moved into organizational development, working with corporates on a one-to-one. It was really around how can I support you to transform your organization so that it's a place where people can not only survive but thrive based on my knowledge, my skill set, and my experience. So that was kind of my personal formula. I love that. And the the writing for 10 minutes, it sounds that it, one might say, oh, that's so easy. It's, I, um, there's an exercise that I'll give um, people where for 12 minutes, they write as though they're a toddler having a temper tantrum, but with the pen do- not leaving the paper, everything, and, and then they burn it, right? And it sounds, oh, 12 minutes. And, and it's amazing what whatever we've repressed and suppressed once it's once it's expressed it's so liberating so what yeah. kind of cakes do you like to bake I need to know <laughs> <laughs> we, well <laughs> I, I like to bake Caribbean cakes which are full of rum <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I, I like I like to bake all kind of cakes um I like to make cakes like lemon drizzle cakes Mm, I love cakes. lemon drizzle. Yeah, lemon drizzle cakes are lovely. So, um, yeah, I just, I just like, I like baking. We watch a lot of the Great British Baking Show, and then there's a new one on Netflix called Crazy Delicious. Have you seen that one? No. no. Oh, and they make they're all self trained chefs, and they make these very elaborate dishes and things and um anyway all of the, it's it's fantastic so we watch a lot of cooking shows and um, my children every day everyone's at home so they're all at home and you know while I'm working I smell like yesterday it was blueberry muffins or they're always baking or it's it's constant so um yes I'm I'm you know I I love that my children are doing that that creative yeah. stuff and um and then I, I also have respect for people who are able to do it. And I, I love cooking. It's a huge outlet for me. And uh, I love cooking um, yeah. food from all over the world. I just ordered yesterday on Amazon some special curry paste. So, <laughs> get it <done>. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We, we, and, and when... When you're reviewing, you know, so anybody who's listening, when you're reviewing your skills, it's not about, you haven't got to be the expert. Because some people say, oh, well, I'm not really that good at it. Oh, maybe, maybe not. Which is why I say, write for 10 minutes. Just keep going. Don't question anything that you write. Don't say, well, am I expert or aren't I expert? Just put it down. There's no right and there's no wrong. The actual point of the exercise is to get it all out there because there's some nuggets that well that you'll have forgotten about. You will have completely forgotten about that. You say, oh, yes, there's another skill. Oh, yes, that's something else that I can do. Well, Jacinth, you are brilliant. And I love, I know today's show has been impactful for so many. And one of the things we always ask is that if today's show resonated with you, we'd love a five-star review. Please share it on social um, and tag us, tag Jacinth, tag me. We will comment. Jacinth, what is the best way for people to reach out and connect with you? If they connect with me via my website, which is www.jacinthiv.com um, and go to the connect go to the connect page and reach out with me for, that way you can take my free assessment on there you can download also three free 
three free chapters of my ebook, which is It's Okay to Be Different, Acknowledge Your Brilliance. So that's the best way of connecting with me. I would encourage everyone to download your ebook because how often do we go through our day feeling different? But take it from Jacinth. It is okay to be different. It is okay when you do your 10. I want everyone to do the 10 minutes of writing. And it's okay if one of your gifts is baking a lemon drizzle. It's okay. okay. <laughs> if, you know, whatever that is yeah. for you. And so, and if I can just tell a very quick an- um, anecdote, Susan. So somebody I was coaching a few weeks ago was wanting to pivot, didn't know So I talked to her and she said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I haven't got anything I can do. So um, I said, so what did you in your spare time? She said, well, I I bake cakes. By the end of that conversation, Susan, we had a whole business around. She made cakes. um, She did flower arranging. Yeah, she does the odd flower arrangement for somebody else. She makes Christmas decorations. She makes sauce. So at the end of that she actually had a business. And so that's why it's really important to really think about the things that you are great at and that you really you really do excel at in all parts of life. I love it. Practical wisdom to uncover our inner brilliance. Well, thank you so much, Jacinth. Everyone You're must welcome. go to Jacinth Ivy. Do the assessment, download the ebook, and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you to all the listeners. Um, I had a really enjoyable time speaking to you. So thank you. And you are brilliant, Susan. Well, thank you so much. And to everyone listening, God bless. Go rock your day. And we will see you on a future episode. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been another epic episode of the Susan Slot Project. For more tips, strategies, and ideas, visit www.susansly.com.